coming straight to the discussion the healthcare sector has been hit by major reforms in the last 3 years there was demonetization there was price control there was ayushman bharat more reforms are on the annual uh, in 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 the healthcare space as well as in the economic space so how will healthcare players maintain viability and attract <clears throat> investments this is what we are going to talk about and i'm really happy to see such a full house so so that all the valuable thoughts can come on the table i would like to perimeter the discussion in such a way that you table only what can be implemented now or in the next 3 years so let 3 years be the outer time limit for all our suggestions uh, so that we can concentrate on the here and now and um, i will hop off here to pass it on to dr rana mehta who will be your moderator dr rana mehta thank you and uh, it's wonderful being here this morning uh, like pavan said i think uh, you know these headwinds have always been there but i think what we really if we take a step back uh, never at this time so at the time of independence i think the whole idea of the government was to build an nhs it probably took them 70 years to realize that they cannot build an nhs and in the meanwhile the private sector so in india you know i think privatization it occurs by default not because the government wants to do it and today you know it's a private led today i think the main fundamental change is the government is now so it was a very poor provider today it's becoming a peer and let's hope it doesn't make the same mistakes uh because again as we move in at least for the secondary and tertiary care it's going to be through insurance and the assurance model uh so i think we are at the cusp of something i was reading a lot and you know one of the things is we are st- at the same stage where the united states was when they started medicare they spent about 5% of the gdp today is closer to 18% so we may not want to make some of those mistakes there but it does give us a great opportunity uh i like this open it's a large thing i like everyone to participate i'll start off with a few people and then just feel you know and we can let the flow go uh i'll start with you know dr mahajan because you know he probably has the greatest insight so last sunday he was with the health minister they opening their new center uh so dr mahajan as you see this whole concept of especially the ayushman bharat and there seems to be an impasse with the private sector and it's on one word and the word is price uh and how do you see that log jam breaking see if we go back in history or if we go back maybe 3 years uh when the health ministry actually started this exercise or maybe had half done this exercise of pricing they came back repeatedly to us saying give us costing and for nearly 2 years that i remember and this was the time when uh, mr c k mishra was first the additional secretary and then the secretary health and every time we would meet as a group individually he would say where is the cost and unfortunately not even a single paper was given to the government about costing and that's when ultimately after that came the niti ayog intervention niti ayog also kept asking the same questions this time the the healthcare industry appeared to be more receptive at least we were going for the meetings we were talking to them and some semblance of a costing was done and this was through fiki uh, in fact dr arvind lal spent his own money doing it uh 10 procedures uh, multiple institutions I, i i my reply may be a little long winded but you have to understand the entire uh, uh, and it seemed that the price <laughs> which had already been notified in some cases was 1/5 of what was calculated as cost and this was in large hospitals in a tier 1 city it was in medium level hospitals 100 beds 300 and more than 300 and also tier 
also the All India Institute. And the surprising part was that the costs as derived appeared to be similar across these three verticals. Uh, and the surprising conclusion was that doctors in tier 2, tier 3 take home more than what they do in tier 1. And tier 1, the uh, uh, land uh, cost is more. So somewhere it compensated, give or take 10, 15%. Uh, there was not much of a differential in cost. By that time, the bullet had been fired. And uh, despite the previous meetings that we had, there was no change that occurred. And, and the scheme has been put in motion. We had extensive meetings with the NHA was formed in the meantime, the Niti Aayog. The health ministry slowly seemed to withdraw. And, uh, 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 you know, they had done their bit. And now, whether it was deliberate withdrawal or whether they were just, uh, you know, led to be at the periphery of the discussions, but that's how it was. And there was a lot of disconnect between Niti Aayog and uh, the health ministry, you know, if the Niti Aayog said something, the ministry would say, you know, the exact opposite. What is the scenario now? We had been hoping. See, there was a short term, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing which the government wanted for through Ayushman Bharat, which it has succeeded also very well. That was winning the election. I, I think this scheme had some role to play, maybe 1%, 1.5% increase, which is substantial. And then there was a the long-term objective, which was actually to deliver the scheme to the masses. In those 7-8 months prior to the election, whatever happened, whatever few lakh cases that were taken up, uh, that resulted in a good uh, impact. Now what is happening, the minister is absolutely certain and this not only a week ago but about two weeks before that in parliament I met him and he said, this rate is okay, this is what you say. And me being at the periphery of things, I am not a hospital provider. Uh, I can say things which probably uh, many hospital providers are very hesitant to speak in public or directly. And one of the problems I see has been that over this last one and a half years, no one from the provider segment has really s spoken out loud that we will not join. They have said, rate they cliche, and I've been there in meetings where, you know, with people who matter, this has been said. And uh, no one has said we won't join. And and I think even till today, that, that may have been said in some kind of, uh, you know, couched language, but it hasn't been said directly. So the government has already always believed, and if you see some of the articles that came over the last few months, uh, in fact, the, uh, uh, the government sector has been saying money is being put in the hands of uh, the private sector, and this is, you know, defrauding the public and all that. Whereas here, the private sector is so scared that what is going to happen if we are forced to do it? And currently, after the minister has spoken in parliament saying that these rates are not going to be revised. The Niti Aayog, NHA tried doing that exercise, which also seemed to be, you know, quite a, a cover-up kind of job. But now the minister has said the rates are not to be advised. That's the situation as it, as it exists today. And that is where we have to see the next three years. Because what happens when most of the centers which can deliver that treatment do not join, then what will be the response of the government? Already, just one little aside, uh, diagnostic centers in Delhi are getting letters from the Competition Commission of India in the last one week, and multiple centers have got it, saying, give us your equipment price, give us your uh, rate list, uh, give us the uh, scans you did, 15, 16, 17, 18, and also give us uh, uh, give us what you think is your per scan cost. So I think something else is brewing in the meantime. And uh, you may be looking at price capping. Whether that will uh, pass legal uh, muster or not, time will tell. But I've been saying for over a year, let's be uh, ready legally. Let's have our arguments done so that when the time <coughs> comes, you can quickly file it. <laughs> Uh, the day is not far because the scheme otherwise is going to fail.
the, the writings on the wall. No, no, I think you have summed it up very well. So, uh, we'll go to Bhavdeep. And Bhavdeep, you've run, a, run one of the biggest hospitals for over a decade. So, how do you react? Uh, Dr. Mahajan said, you know, one of the things was that the providers have always taken a back seat and not confronted it. How do you see the healthcare now going in the next three years, especially from a private sector viability and sustainability perspective? <clears throat> so, look, I think that... Um, I think Harsh, I mean, the comments that you made are absolutely right in terms of where we are today. Um, I think the, um, the, the notion of the fact that perhaps private health care players um, on the provider side haven't spoken up or quite honestly, <clears throat> I think the target has been not just a moving target, but just a, a very fast moving target. Uh, nobody actually knows just exactly where this is all going to land or how it plays out. And, and what position do you take, right? To what end? I think there's just been a bit of a concern around, um, because the dialogue between Niti Aayog and the private players has been around pricing, as you rightly said. Because if you remember, the initial approach was extremely aggressive, that this is the price, and there's not gonna be too much discussion around it. Uh, many of us on the provider side got, um, had discussions, conversations with different, um, different parties in the government, um, encouraging us to, to sign up. And quite honestly, I don't think that I don't think that even today anybody's going to say, no, we're not going to do it. Right? Because it's a, uh, e either from a logic perspective, I mean, <clears throat> we can all, uh, and I have my views, obviously, we can all have our, our views, we can disagree very strongly or strongly, whatever it might be, but the reality is that some form of Aishwan Bharat or whatever you want to call it is here to stay. It's going to be a part of the um, healthcare uh, ecosystem for the next whatever amount of time. So that's coming for sure. Now the question is, what does it look like? What kind of shape does it have? Just exactly how does it get on boarded? And then ultimately, you know, if you look at um, the viability piece, right? How do you have a viable healthcare system, a private healthcare system that can actually support it? So, so I think that's the. Um, so there is no ifs and buts about it. I mean, the good news is that over the last um, 12 months, or perhaps eight to 10 months, the government has become very receptive to having more discussion, more conversation. Uh, it's funny what you talked about earlier about the fact that when. There's all discussion on, on building up pricing. Give us the costing model. Um, you know, we haven't had a lot, whole lot of collaboration within the industry. So it's almost as if um, who brings first between the providers to actually talk about what the actual cost is of doing something uh, because of all the various, all the reasons that you are familiar with. So I think, I think, that's, I think that's a fair point. <clears throat> I think, Rana, to your point, uh, you know, one of the, so I, I left Fortis in May. And uh, it, it's very interesting when you step out of the system, the, the perspective and the view and the conversations you start to have that otherwise, you know, that I wasn't having earlier. And one of the things that, in fact, Rana and I have talked about this a little bit, is that we're actually in a very unique uh, situation here in the Indian healthcare system. If you look at <coughs> the entire ecosystem of our uh, of healthcare in this country today, you have seven stakeholders. You have seven stakeholders. <coughs> you have the patient, you have the doctor, you have the operator, you have the investor, you have the government, you have insurance, and then you have partners, right? Whether it's vendor partners, whatever. You have seven stakeholders. And we are, <coughs> and then you look at <coughs> the demand of the product that this industry provides, right? The disease burden, aging, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that. So the <coughs> demand is only going up and up and up. But you have a very unique situation where all seven stakeholders are unhappy. <coughs> There's not one stakeholder in the entire healthcare ecosystem today that's actually happy or satisfied with where they are today. In fact, everybody's wondering, all seven are wondering about the viability and their viability going forward. So that, that creates either a, a tsunami of sorts or a massive opportunity of sorts. And I think that, um, you know, I think that perhaps some of the things we can discuss here. So let me just step back one more thing that I'll share with you is, um, so you have the, <clears throat> Because if you look at the way things are run today, if you just had to, if you could chart out things over a period of time, if you look at the current trajectory, right, the intellectual capital, the intellectual activity taking place, the investments that are taking place, if you look at what's happening in the space, there are two or three big things that are happening. So one is the dialogue that um, um, Harshu just talked about now between what does some version of Aishman Bharat, some, so that's one vertical, if you will, of activity that's taking place. The second big thing that's happening right now is the investment. Right? If you look at what happened with Fortis, right, obviously with IHA, if you look at uh, the Max and, and KKR piece, 
you look at Medanta with um, Ranjan and with with TPG, and and probably the the hospital system in Pune with um, um, that's um, that's also yeah, Everstone. Everstone, Everstone. Everstone's investing. So you have a lot of so you have that. That's another vertical that you have a lot of new money coming into the market, <coughs> into the into the industry, into the ecosystem. But there's a very clear ROI approach here. And so that's the second vertical. That's probably interesting to look at. The third one <coughs> that I've had a great deal of exposure to in the last three, four months is the whole notion of innovation and startup. And um, this is the conversation that I had with Rana actually, is that I probably met about 30, 40 startups in the last four or five months. And what's very interesting about um, all the startups is that you have some really, really bright, really smart, intelligent people. You know, the kind of kids that, we, um, <coughs> that, um, that we'd be proud of. Um, but they're all focusing on small verticals. Everybody's focusing on a small niche. I've yet to meet anybody who's looking at the entire ecosystem to say everybody's trying to fix a small, small, small piece, which is which is fine as well. Uh, but I think one of the concerns there is that that um, that you know at what point are you able to knit all of this together? So <clears throat> I think Rana, I think the uh, notion of having a very candid conversation, right? Um, at some point, you have to ask yourself um, very clearly is that what role does a forum like this play? Right? I was thinking about that this morning. So what happens after this, a forum like this, number one? Number two, we have the, um, the FICIs of the world and the CIIs and the NETHELs of the world, and there's a lot of good work taking place there as well. But I think if the most important thing that probably needs to come out, and I'll go back, Harsh, to your first comment, is uh, how does the industry, uh, because there's a unique opportunity here, A, to do the right thing, Right, B uh, to actually start solving some of the issues and challenges we have, but there's a massive commercial opportunity here as well. A massive, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, most of us are here uh, from some commercial angle, one way or the other. There's a massive commercial angle as well because of how big the opportunity is. So, I think that that thinking about it, that those are in my mind, those are the three big things that are happening right now. A, the dialogue with the government with respect to some form of Aishman Bharat, B, <coughs> the investment that's coming in. Right? And the only, that's the good news is there's lots of investment coming in. The concerning point is it's all with an ROI component. Everything is about, you know, what kind of return do you get and how quickly do you exit. And third is you have a tremendous, and, and I'm sure all of you already know this, I'm just, uh, I've been a bit shocked and I've had my eyes open quite wide at the amount of um, people that are looking at things to do in this space from a startup perspective, but each one of them handling small, 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 small things versus a comprehensive conversation on a bigger approach. No, excellent. And I think, uh, you know, we're very siloed. I think all the skill sets in India exist. Our ability to put it together like an Amazon or Facebook, we haven't done it. Uh, you know, uh, I think one of the good places to start is obviously speak to the investors. So, uh, but can Ajit, I just make one last comment? I'm sorry, yeah, just sure. Make one, just, just tell me what you just mentioned. I spoke at a, <clears throat> I spoke at a, a leadership meeting. Um, you know, every once in a while we all get called to deliver keynote addresses, things like that. And I spoke at Microsoft's uh, meeting sometime back there, Southeast Asia, right? And, um, and so I, I was I know, 10, 11 a.m., whatever I was supposed to speak, and I went in a few minutes early, and um, I think it was the head of strategy or somebody who was speaking before me. Uh, I don't know if anybody's here from Microsoft, but, um, but what was interesting was that when they talked about their key priorities going forward, um, one of the top five priorities was healthcare. And I'm only saying that because you mentioned Amazon, uh, because I think that one of the things, if there's a wake up call for all of us, and one of the things that I've become absolutely, absolutely convinced about, uh, is that the competitor we should all be worried about in, in our respective industries, the competitor that all of us should least sleep over is the one we haven't yet heard about. And uh, it's going to be the most unlikely um, competitor who I think is gonna come and eventually, if we don't do something, then somebody else will. Sorry. No, true. I think the... Just, just one point, Dr. Rana. I think what Dr. Mahajan mentioned and what Bhavdeep was saying, if the health minister is saying there is no more increase in the rate, and viability is like one of the issues, and you mentioned like last 70 years, NHS has not worked. So even if they are now putting pressure on private sector, <laughs> so it might also crumble down in like few years, you know, if, if they keep insisting that maybe you need to charge lower prices. Unless something like competitive comes in and how will you be kind of managing it, I think needs to be debated because otherwise, 
your private sector would also come down and then you are in a dire state yeah. so so i think that's that's one of the fundamentals the viability you know and uh, i think uh, no credit but most sectors in india have gone through this and you know uh, it's and this is something i don't think the the gov- private sector in india did not expect in every places regulation comes it was very light touch regulation because the government was not very successful as a provider uh i don't know navjeevan and it's great to hear from actually the institutions which invest and you know the financial investors and you know one of the theses i heard uh, you know when i went to a jp morgan conference earlier this year uh, was this is actually a good time to invest it's a, taking a contrarian bet uh nobody's building more fortresses nobody's building more maxes the apollos have stopped so at the high end there's going to be a shortage of beds because you're not your supply side is getting for constraint and that creates more value from you i mean it's not great for the country but that's a contrarian view from an investor point of view and they always say why let a crisis go to waste so navjeevan how do you see this opportunity pan out uh, you know while there's a lot of doom but there's a lot of opportunity so oh, sure uh I think it is exciting time. First of all, I think uh, discussing about this Ayushman scheme, um, I agree with uh, Mr. Mahajan. I think uh, I think everybody in their own shell was a little bit surprised and shocked by the pricing, but there was no uh, public outcry. I did not see any kind of forum or any kind of legal case. And every conference I went, uh, everybody said, you know, this pricing is not viable. Uh, let's do something about it. But uh, I did not see any kind of you know. Uh, operator led or you know hospital led kind of body looking at that pricing and now i i don't think there'll be any change in pricing i think government is pretty much set they have won on this formula i think aishman is here to stay so we have to kind of live with it uh you as operators but partners and we as investors uh what has what has happened is that that uh, aishman at least in its initial stages has put pressure on most of the uh operators financials uh what we have seen is a huge build of receivables uh, a stress on working capital uh and uh, the change of mentality of operations uh, by the operators now 3 4 years back when aishman was not set uh, we never used to devote too much time on what is a bad debt or what is the kind of receivables building up how do we kind of you know discount that how, what is the kind of haircut we we give to those receivables but now actually as investors we spend a lot of time looking at what is the receivables of the government how much is outstanding whether it should come back what is it esi is it echs is it cghs you know is it psu tps what is it and then you spend some time okay what haircut should i give to esi what haircut should i give to echs cghs and then you go back how much is online how much is manual so i think it's just uh, it's just sheer wastage of uh, resources sheer wastage of uh, both operators time as well as investors time and it discourages people uh, especially the foreign investors i mean people who are domestic investors are still uh, you know they still understand the ground realities but foreign investors they just don't want to get into this uh, mess of you know calculating haircuts or you know if i'm investing in a hospital i'm investing in a hospital i'm not devoting my time to running behind you know government agencies to get my money back so i think that definitely discourages hospital what has happened to operators is obviously the working capital has increased india per se is not a cheap capital provider if you see uh, the cost of capital is quite high and as the receivers build up as your on one hand the government wants your hospitals to expand but the, on the other hand it 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 actually uh, results in increasing the working capital requirement given the kind of you know uh, receivers we are building up and then it just gets into a downward spiral because then the financials are so bad that the hospital starts cutting corners on the cost or on the quality of services or you know so i think that has uh, definitely led to uh, i would say a little bit of negative sentiment from investors to the hospital side hospital anyway is a is a is a capex in- intensive or capital intensive kind of uh, you know business so anyway you are putting uh, uh, money on on a heavy balance sheet and again if the receivables are building up with the working capital situation is bad i think um, it just kind of discourages a lot of foreign capital uh the other thing is that i think uh, what uh, what is it resulting is a little bit of consolidation on the smaller hospital side uh because of this situation uh, a lot of smaller hospitals or regional based or maybe you know hospitals which have one or two small hospitals running of 
150 beds, you know, less than 200 beds, they are not able to kind of uh, carry on with this kind of uh, constraints. So I think that is an opportunity because uh, we see a lot of uh, the small hospitals operator coming to us and saying that, you know, uh, our brand is good. Uh, obviously, the demand is really good. We are in an area which is underserved. It's just that, you know, the whole Ayushman thing and the pricing and the fact that too much of regulation, we are just not able to do it. I think that uh, lately we have seen, uh, we've seen a little bit of, you know, an attractive opportunity in kind of either consolidating or getting into really good regional small chains. Uh, I like it because, first of all, it's unlike Fortis, Max or Apollo, which are bigger and they, it takes a lot of time to change a strategy. And when there is regulatory change, the impact of uh, that regulatory chain on these big or regulatory change on these big hospital is quite huge. But uh, on the regional smaller hospital side, I think they are very nimble. Uh, if there is a change in the regulatory perspective, they are they are more flexible, and we can change the strategy quite quite fast as compared to let's say Apollo, Max, Fortis, or you know. Uh, so I think that that is an opportunity. I think consolidation in in regional hospitals, smaller chain, is just definitely an opportunity for investors. Uh, the other thing is that uh, three, four, or four, five years back, the bigger hospitals or you know branded hospitals never kind of spent a lot of time on cost control. People were happy with the pricing, pricing was going up, uh, affluent class, affluent patients, so you know there was no regulatory cap, there was no Ayushman. So a lot of these hospitals, we've seen that uh, cost control was way down on the priority list. It was more on branding and getting you know good good patients or you know people who can pay. But lately this has changed, given, uh, given the uh, capping on the pricing and the fact that there is a alternative anyway comparative intensity increase now we see a lot of hospitals talking a lot more on cost rather than the top line which is very good uh, people have now you know consolidated their procurement and people now talk a lot of cost control operational efficiencies as well which which obviously you know makes us smile because a lot of now these instead of us teaching them i think a lot of people are paying paying stress on uh, cost control I think that is an opportunity. Uh, hospitals which can, which have shown a track record of controlling cost, I think uh, those are the opportunities we definitely like, rather than you know the top line increasing uh, uh, steadily. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in terms of what uh, Shana mentioned in the morning uh, when this session started, what is the two or three things we should do? I think we should definitely, as government, we should move to a tiered. Uh, level of hospitals, something which catered to only Ayushman, something which catered to only private patients. I think that is something which the government can do and can incentivize as well, because they can actually tier the or put the hospitals in bracket. I mean, for example, uh, we've seen you know markets in Thailand, they they do everything. I mean, the, there's some of the hospitals which which are just public and they do just public at a good quality, and then they are just private. For example, which do you know international tourism or high end seven star hospitals and everything and the government never touches them. So if the system works really well. If the government can give a bit of clarity and tier the hospitals and say, okay, this is your mandate and this is your mandate and can incentivize. So I think that is something which, which the government should work towards. And that is what will kind of give a little bit of assurance to the foreign investors as well. Okay, this, this is my tier. Okay, this is the tier I'm investing in. And this is the level of interference of government I can expect in this tier. So that makes a little bit of you know, more visibility uh, to investors as well. Uh, lastly, um, as Bhavdeep said, I think we should be ready for Amazon and Microsoft to come in healthcare sector. We've already seen that in the pharmacy uh, distribution, uh, and I think we should be ready with, uh, I don't know how it will come, but uh, I think healthcare will be battleground for these guys as well. Very good points, Navjeevan. Thank you very much. and. Uh, really valuable points my only request is that so that everybody <coughs> gets a chance to speak if everybody can reduce his uh, uh, or limit his comment to one or two minutes and also make it additive and not repetitive if something has already been said let us uh, skip that and uh, just move forward rana ah, thank you and i think navjeevan brought in something <coughs> you know you really need to segregate why you're forcing every hospital to do the same thing like the thailand is a good example I mean, you have the five-star hotels, you have the OAOs, you have the gingers, they all work in a business model. 
if Aishman Bharat has a business model, there will be takers, you know. There are a couple of billion dollars on the table. So you need to make the business model viable and then. I'll go to Sunil next. And, you know, Sunil, you have had a lot of experience of investing in the tier two, tier three hospitals. And that's where the demand needs to come in. Today, you know, Gurgaon is oversupplied. Bangalore is oversupplied. So we are not really looking at these areas. But there have been major challenges. And, you know, Aishman Bharat in that has not really helped. So how do you see the viability there? You know, while one of the biggest problems with this is, you know, we already have a supply side constraint, but we bring in a demand side solution. So the economics don't work at the macro level. Well, thanks, Rana. So, uh, yeah, we've had the fortune of investing uh, both in uh, hospitals that are in tier one, tier two, tier three cities. And I see, uh, you know, uh, the big difference uh, uh, in, in the way uh, one goes, goes about uh, uh, approaching uh, the provision of services. And clearly, you know, just to give you an example, uh, when this whole stent price uh, capping happened, there were few hospitals in our portfolio which didn't bear the brunt of uh, uh, the price cap. Why? Because they, they followed a very simple rule right from day one. Their markup was 10% over the purchase price. So the, we didn't get dented on the margins. So it's about how you approach uh, the provision of a services. That is one important element. The second is, you know, how do you bring all the stakeholders together right from day one, you know, how do you do your clinical uh, engagement program, which is very, very important because if you see the the margin benefit that we get on uh, the consumables, pharma and on the diagnostic is goes to subsidize what we lose on the services side. So how do you cater to, how do you approach the entire provision of services from a supply side, you know, the engagement of all the components? That is very, very critical. Having said that, you know, the prices that we have in today's regime is still not profitable for even a tier two, tier two hospital. So there are challenges on that side. And, you know, our view as an investor is that we as a industry player should get together, uh, you know, on an SRO concept and try to table the uh, issues to the government. It may be late in the day, but I guess, you know, we have no other option. And when I say as a stakeholder, means all the components, the, you know, the pharma suppliers, the diagnostic, uh, uh, you know, suppliers and vendors, uh, the clinicians, you know, who are very, very important uh, part of the uh, uh, equation. All of us should get together as one industry body because, you know, most of the time that we've seen, you know, it's either the healthcare providers who are making the representation or the pharma or the med devices making the representations. Today, one thing very positive and I was telling Pawan is that you have a wider, uh, you know, uh, representative having a pharma company like Centis here, med devices company and healthcare providers. So this is the kind of gathering that we should have and try and create a SRO concept to approach the government. So that's on the challenge side. Now on the opportunity side, you know, we see huge amount of opportunity and these opportunities come from, for us in two ways. One is supply chain disruptors. Because now the industry players are forced to cut down the cost, they will have to go in each and every component of the value chain and see where where uh, you know they can save cost and world over there is significant amount of wastage in the entire value chain and obviously it's led by us where you know there is no formula to fix but in a country like india there are significant opportunities if we start breaking down the uh, value chain and here i see a couple of players you know who are prime example you know we have a company like medica bazaar which is now providing direct consumables to hospitals in tier two tier, tier three tier four cities we have a player like shubram who's now saying that you know uh, you outsource all the non-clinical part to a player who knows best. You get quality, you get that, you get price benefit. Now, if you start breaking the entire value chain, there is significant amount of costing. And that is an opportunity for investors like us. There are models which are access accelerators. You know, 40% of the population in India don't have provision of healthcare. Now, if you back models, and there are quite a few of them, you know, the basic one is telemedicine, which is still struggling, but there are quite ample number of opportunities. If you back those kind of players, encourage them, you know, through industry participation, through investor backing, the load on the tertiary care will go down. There are multiple ways in which, you know, one would benefit. If you focus on primary care, the load, uh, you know, uh, the patient, because our clinical pathway is a bit distorted. Even for cuff and fold, we end up in a multi-speciality hospital. So if you start focusing just on these two aspects, which is the value chain disruptors and the access accelerators, I think the costing will settle down to a reasonable level. Not sure if you'll still make money with, you know, the Ayushman Bharat there, but at least it's a good starting point for us. So that's the way we see mm -hmm. challenges and opportunities. 
Exactly. You know, why let a crisis go to waste? And, you know, this is anywhere the headwinds won't go away. So we'll have to see and change the model. It's happened in Japan. It's happened in South Korea. It's happened in Turkey. So we're not the only country. But maybe we're a little more draconian than the others. Uh, I think one of the good things you said is the healthcare ecosystem is splintered. You know, it's not like NASCOM. We go together and every part of the ecosystem. I mean, IT means NASCOM and we don't have that. So, uh, uh if I may just supplement what he has said, and this is, even though today I'm in a completely separate sphere, which is on leadership consulting and advisory related to life science and healthcare practice, I kind of cut my teeth into the pharmaceutical and then medical devices and have had some of these interactions when these issues were first first surfacing. surfacing. Uh, you mentioned a very, or I think a number of you mentioned the fact that uh, while there has been one NASCOM for the IT space, healthcare, multiple stakeholders speaking at different levels. And uh, just going back to a little bit of a history is when some of these issues were actually surfacing where you actually, you know, yes, it is a fact that there were opportunities in terms of looking at the value chain and where, how you could optimize the cost there. You could also look at access accelerators at that point of time, when there was this call to be uh, to present a unified perspective of this, as far as the overall delivery of services was concerned, I think maybe all of us are probably wiser on hindsight when some segments of these or some of the stakeholders chose to say or say that they would, you know, uh, fight their own battle, and all of us we actually need to fight each other our own battles. Maybe we progress from there on to where we are now looking at it. And I think from my, you know, if you were to ask me as a observer from outside, it's important that there is a holistic view of the service being delivered and all multiple stakeholders, <coughs> the seven stakeholders that Bhavdeep talked, uh, talked about, they get onto one platform. The other thing which is also there is while Yes, we need to look at the global trends as well as the local trends. Global trends are where you are seeing these various disruptions, innovative disruptions which are taking place, whether it is in terms of supply chain optim cost optimization, whether it is access accelerators. But the larger issue in our, this thing which is related to the local is the fact that this overall healthcare service provision, the issue of payers, you know, how does a person access healthcare afford accessible healthcare, all this is basically requires an ecosystem. And I think that's the larger one, even as, um, you know, people are sensing opportunities and they are some of the equity, private equity players are coming into it. I think what needs to be looked at is in terms of the larger, I would say the elephant in the room is still going to be, how do you create a viable healthcare ecosystem? And for that, I, you know, it all starts from first unifying and looking at it holistically. I, I think one of the points, no, <clears throat> when you talk to people collectively or separately, everybody is talking the same thing to the government. It's not that providers are saying it's affordable, med devices are saying it's affordable. <clears throat> but with the government, it's the same thing. So Mr. Nana, I just wanted to bring <coughs> that point that there is a body called Nat Health. Like you have NASCOM, but the effectiveness of Nat Health is a point. So Nat Health has obviously the expectation from Nat Health. Well, you know, there's a combined body of healthcare providers, of devices, and all the hospital providers. So they have not played an effective role. Yeah. For, so for so I think the whole idea of uh, you know Nat Health was set up for using NASCOM, but maybe it's not been an, over a period of time. I also, think I think the, the last, last six it, months, it's yes, become very it's and, picking and up. Uh, yeah. uh, so Dr. Mahajan is the best person to tell. Yeah, I think yeah, the energy levels have changed as uh, you know some of the permanent. <laughs> The players in that organization, you know, have changed. The secretary general has changed. We have a new secretary general. And uh, I think uh, uh, credit to NatHealth that about three weeks ago, an Ayushman Bharat ideal model of a hospital with its costs <coughs> and with the procedure prices, costs on this side of setting up and running, and these are pragmatic, practical costs. And on the other hand, uh, uh, with a mix of patients, some cardiology, gastro, fever, this, that, what a 100-bed hospital would have, 
and then looking at the procedure prices of uh, Ayushman Bharat and trying to balance the two. Right now, this is here and this is here. Uh, and, and, you know, it may come here if you are very... Because 50% of your costs are your salaries and the take home of the so, doctor. So, I just interrupt you for a moment yeah. because you are talking about that. <clears throat> so, why did this not idea not come that CHS rates were already there from 2011-12? With the circular saying that they will be applicable only for two years and they still have not been revised in 2019. So, the same rates would have been taken if the government wanted Sir, to the, 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 so the, the reason is very clear that we are a divided house. Yes. We have yes. never been together. The providers are uh, law unto themselves, you know. The attempt now after it has come and hit and maybe, uh, uh, you know, if the government were to really uh, force you or coerce you. Sir, can I add, can I add some statistics here? Please, please. There are 32 countries in this world which actually follow successful universal health coverage scheme. 77 countries adopted it. 45 countries failed. And you know what was the biggest reason behind it? 32 countries had maximum public health care. 45 countries had private health care as a dominant players. I think the change has to start by participation of the population. It can't be a 100% government funded scheme. Wherever it has been a government funded scheme in a private health care domain, it has not been at a real successful thing. I think we have to take the lead from markets like US. Nine nine six seven dollars per capita is the spend per on on US. We are talking of sub hundred dollar country in India, and we are talking of universal health coverage. It is not possible. Frankly, it's not possible because you can't have universal health coverage in a thirteen hundred million population country and think of achieving a price which is giving us a kind of standard treatment. It is certainly not possible. I think the change has to start. Government recently launched like five years. Uh, I think when Modi government started in 2014, they had launched something like a paid health insurance scheme, right? It was something like 2 lakh rupees with just what 100 rupee kind of a premium a year. How many people opted for it? In fact, it was with Jandhan Yojana also, you know, that private, you know, when they started opening up the bank accounts, how many people act actually opted for it? It was not even, a, a, you know, 10 million population. It was, a, it was a serious failure because whenever government thinks of public, you know, kind of involvement, it, it never catches up. That's the biggest fallacy. That's the biggest problem we have. Also, I, I think also think. the federal system makes it more difficult. Yeah, I think. Uh, and the other thing is, this is, I think Vivek brought out, this is the largest non-contributory scheme in the world. It's So when it's a non-contributory scheme, it's an entitlement. People go to a hospital and tell me, where's my five lakhs, you know. Yes. And, and that, that that is being forced on private happen. players. No, that that's is being happen. forced on hospitals. Yeah. That's the biggest yeah. problem. Yeah. So, so, so I, no, I, think, one, I think we are, when you say no. Uh, sure. I, th I think yeah. we are uh, harping on, uh, you know, the failure of the government to implement this kind of a scheme. Uh, like Ayushman Bhai. But I think we should focus more on now that it's upon us. What should we do about it? Yeah. Let me tell you. I have done some serious work on the Ayushman's pricing and it's doable. It may come as a shock to all of you, but I have looked at cardiology, that's my field, and I've seen that it's very well doable once we get all the stakeholders out of the same table. We just need to tell the cardiologist that you'll get this much. You get that stent guy to get the stent at that price, which is comfortable to him. It is comfortable today for him to give a stent at 13,000, right? You've got a 65,000. Uh, uh, what you call reimbursement on Ayushman Bharat and consumables, total consumables can come down to 8,000. If you really put your heads to it, it is doable. And of course, we should have a unified forum. We have been traditionally very, very meek and ununited. No, I mean, healthcare providers have always been not the ones who raise their voices because we are in this business of healthcare when we are supposed to be doing what is told to us. But I think it's time <coughs> to raise your voice and at the same time, you have to give enough confidence to the government that we are there to help you <coughs> in this scheme. We are there to provide, as we have been doing for the last three decades, to give health care provision to all the people of India. When you failed, we are going to go with you now also. But going ahead, we would also like to have a dialogue on some revision of some prices which are entirely non-doable. There are some which are doable, some which are entirely non-doable. 
So you have to have this dialogue going on. It's only then you can come to some kind of a conclusion. And I'm telling you, as everybody is mentioning, it's a massive opportunity. You can scale down the level of your services, not make it five star, make it without compromising on quality and still deliver with profitable margins. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, one caution, which I would say, because I've been dealing with some policy makers around, around this element, is that the government typically being a policy maker throws in Irishman Bharat as an impact, um, imperfect, but, you know, largely sort of a pilot. It throws it into the pond and sees the reactions. <clears throat> If the reactions are silence, as Dr. Mahajan said, then it says, well, maybe, you know, we can tweak it even more. If the reactions are piecemeal, you know, to Bhavdeep's point, if one vertical starts looking at, or one stakeholder starts looking at efficiency, it says, okay, fine, this is a great way to consolidate efficiencies. Till there is an aggressive counter narrative, Ayushman will remain in that pond because there is no viable resistance. The point where I'm making is that one is to show a model which says, here's a hospital model which works, which certainly addresses some issues. But the other is to come up with a very counter radical model. And one of the things it was interesting when we were having this discussion was that why don't you give access to the government hospitals? Because one of the biggest costs is also real estate. Give us access to those hospitals. We can make greater efficiency on those capacities like we are doing in airports. And, you know, that could help create more scale and, you know, create more efficiencies. So you can't cherry pick the model. And what was interesting is the government said, okay, now that sounds interesting. So the model which they've thrown is not a commandment. It's just a way of testing what is the level of consolidation, level of knowledge, level of confidence in the industry, or is everyone kind of happy polishing their piece of the stakeholder pie? So that's the only thing I'd say is that a radical counter which goes beyond the parameters set by Ayushman would may, may evoke a much more positive response because they are looking for leadership in, in many ways. Uh, and if you look at typically what's happened in other countries, the prices have continuously gone up. You know, look at the US, you know, from 5% to 18%. Same thing has happened in Thailand. In no country where they've done universal health care. I like people from this side, uh, you know, we uh, somebody like to... I would like to... Yeah. So I think uh, that's a very important point is like that in terms of uh, every policy which the government has announced, they have always been kind of readjusting that. You see the scene of GST as Sir said, in terms of, you know, they, they see the counter response from the industry and then they kind of fine tune that. And that is what they have been, I think, waiting from the healthcare as well in terms of and we simply went into one dimension of how to manage the show in that perspective. So... Uh, and a very good suggestion was given on the platform today was to create some tier kind of pricing in terms of, you know, that uh, a tier city or a 50 bedded hospital cannot compete a 500 bedded hospital. So it can be a differentiating pricing program, which can make the more viable solution for a hospital to charge at a differential pricing and, uh, and make still viable. See, most of the policies when government think, they do not think as a, a top tier hospitals to uh, keeping in mind as a perspective, they always see as a larger picture of the entire rural health, which where they're actually counter on. So most of their policies are focused and strategized for that side. And if you see NHM program for free diagnostics for all, it's not actually meant for the major cities, it's all for the rural sectors. And so that's where a lot of their most of the funding actually goes. But uh, in that frame, framework, if we can also implement in terms of something tier pricing based mechanism. Tier pricing is actually, actually already in there. Place. Okay. You know, uh, in Ayushman Bharat, if you are NABH accredited, you can charge 10% more. Okay. And if you also have DNB in the hospital, you can charge a further 10%. So that is there. But when the cost is 40,000 and the price is 10,000, then that 20% increase will take you to 12,000. 12,000. So does it make a difference? That's I think, where I think, I think it's a more about fair problem. price. In terms of not actually, uh, so I think it's more about the fair price in terms of, uh, if, uh, like uh, doctor said that uh, it is viable. But see, the government also sees us what is the costings for an import of a, any stent in India. And and based on that, how much it should be scaled up to. See, and the viability, he's put a caveat. Correct. If the cardiologist were to lower, lower his price, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if today, suppose he takes 30,000 for a procedure, is he willing to take 3,000? You know, so that there's a big caveat. Caveat. Not that low. 11 is 
But but the whole issue of a professional, how can you decide? Do you tell a Supreme Court lawyer that you know you take only five thousand because for this case he still takes his one crore? So I think where do you tell a professional that you know this is the price you? Because Especially when there is a shortage. There is a there is a market. Uh, can I just uh, just add to what uh, Manjana ji had said? Just as a uh, ground reality, when when stamp pricing got capped in. Um, Um, March April 2017. Our assumption on the operating side was uh, that there would be a natural um, consolidation from a pricing perspective, and though you know the whole clinician cost and what you pay doctors, the assumption was three six months ki baat hai, and it will just be a matter of time that what you pay, um, you know, we just talked about the cost of procedure and what do you pay a doctor. You mentioned that point earlier as well. That what you pay a cardiologist would actually come down, and we actually thought that. If you pay a good cardiologist, let's assume in the current market rates in the northern part of the country, anyway, for a cardiologist doing 60, 70 angioplasties a month potentially, you're probably paying all said and done whatever the let's just use X, whatever that number is. Our assumption was, say, mine ki baat hai, saal ki baat hai, that you'll be paying something south of X because the cost will come down. Actually, the reverse happened. Reverse happened, and I can tell you that there has been so just a ground reality that the Salaries commanded by a good cardiologist have not gone down since the pricing of angioplasties <coughs> was capped. On the contrary, uh, to your point about the quality and the amount of good cardiologists available, you talked about the fact that this is your space. I'm just telling you that ground reality. Our assumption was that if you're going to pay somebody else, you'll get south. Actually, not true at all. Uh, the good talent continues to command more, and today they command more than ever. So, this just. So, but uh, uh, another point: Did the cost of angioplasty come down? Of course, it did. No, it is. No, no. The cost of the, this from a stent, obviously, because the so stent can. Everybody will understand. Yeah. yeah. The See, ultimately, it's a, you're this, the dog. You're chasing your tail a little bit, right? In terms of where do you, so what, 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 what do you pay? Do? Obviously, I mean, the cost have, have, have to be factored. You have a push pull component here, right? Yeah. I mean, if at, at the end of the day, if you could, if a cardiologist could, so instead of paying X, was making something south of X, then you can start looking at cost of procedure and say, okay, let's start bringing things down. But the reality is, if that doesn't happen. Then what does any system forget about any pr- across the country? So, actually, the stent capping was a whole exercise in futility. The government touted it as bringing it, making it more affordable to poorer patients. The stents, but they forgot that we already had a capping on the CGH stent prices much before that, December two thousand thirteen, and we had stents available for twenty two thousand since December two thousand thirteen. So the option of a affordable stent was already there for the poorer people. The rich could afford, or the people who could afford were. Going to get the better stents. Now the situation is changing. Now even if you can afford, you will not be able to get the latest stent. So if I might add, no, in fact, just uh, 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 yeah, sure. you know, two three things I think we are totally forgetting here. At the delivery point, I belong to Narayana Health, and I think we have been uh, pioneers of so-called affordable health. And you know, I just want to bring some things in perspective here. What we are totally forgetting is that healthcare. Works on the basic principle of cross subsidization. Whatever you might talk, you know what the hospitals do is, you have X number of cash patients, and you they pay you a X amount of money, and you have X number of panel or patients. You cross subsidize, you know them each other, and they somehow give you a EBITDA margins of around twelve to eighteen percent, depending on your cost efficiencies. The second cross subsidization, of course, was that. Um, You also took care of these higher margins on drugs, implants, stents, etc., because you know there that's where you earned your money, and you somehow cross subsidize that against the payments that you made to doctors, etc. Now, what's going to happen is that uh, your ep- ability or the capability of a private healthcare provider to give this cross subsidized healthcare is going to reduce because obviously your margins are reducing. the number of panel patients are going to increase your cash patients are going to reduce so the leeway that was available to us at the delivery side is going to be very very skewed and very small so the basic principle of my doing a business is now altering that means the mistakes that we have done in the past of not foreseeing what the future is going to be is the same mistake that we are doing today aishman bharat margin capping stent capping government controlling is something which is going to happen without doubt and that's almost on top of it we might have 5% up and down with discussion but that is not going to change we will have to change the way we do our businesses in healthcare without doubt because if we don't do that 
that we are not going to be even earning that margin. And I think um, the uh, ability to look into the future has been the biggest downfall of healthcare sector because we are talking today when Aishman Bharat is on top of us. And let me be very fair with you, Aishman Bharat has not yet hit us at all. None of the major healthcare providers today have Aishman Bharat on them. There are no receivables which have piled up because of Aishman Bharat. In fact, as on date, because the budgetary allocation for Aishman Bharat is so much, the government will be able to pay you very fast. The problems exist in CGHS, ECHS, but not in Aishman Bharat at all. The, la the last point which I want to make is that the cost of healthcare to a cash patient and to the insured patient is going to go high because somewhere or the other, what the hospitals are going to look at, you're not going to have a leeway to you know argue with the government. Government is going to push its way. Here is where the cost of the uh, uh, you know treatment is going to go up. And just to uh, 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 you know <coughs> substantiate what Babdeep sir said. That when the stents, stent prices were capped and you saw it, what the hospitals did was did not reduce the cost of angioplasty. They simply increased the room rent or the procedure charge. So what the patient paid in the end remained the same. So contrary to the belief that the cost of healthcare went down, it did not. So that brings us to a point that we will have to look at healthcare as a business in a very, very different manner. And in fact, I would go to say, and we are looking at it that way. Will hospital exist in what it exists today or the hospitals itself are going to change in the way they're going to be in the future. And if we don't look at it today, you're going to be having the same discussions again and again and land on the same solutions. I think that's very, very valid. I think the whole viability and the business model and, you know, if we don't change, the government anyway is going to change us yeah. uh, from that perspective. So I, I like to add to, you know, uh, uh, your point basically. See, we, we are the first one to get into the group purchase organization, the GPO model in India, catering to mid-size hospitals, small nursing homes, specifically into tier 2, 380 town. And uh, what we observed after dealing with, say, hundreds of hospitals in the last three, four years' time, that, you know, uh, if you look into a 100-bedded, 200-bedded hospitals, they have a very different setup problem to a smaller hospital in a tier town. Smaller hospital in tier town, most likely entrepreneur, doctor run, uh, 80 to 100 bedded or maybe 30 to 100 bedded. They are looking availability, efficiency, adoption of tech and how they can keep enhancing their operational, you know, productivity. I think for them, Ayushman Bharat, you know, comes more as an opportunity than as a challenge because they are always looking See, their survivability, there's no P coming there. There's no, you know, external money coming there. They have to fund themselves. They keep looking into efficiency. Then we met number of those hospitals in small town like Bardha or in Ratlam, where these doctors are only looking efficiency, availability and utility as a major focus. While you come to the larger hospitals, you know, no matter what price we have, if we look into Ayushman Bharat only primarily on account of what price cap is going to come, it will be a very myopic view on, you know, on the overall problem. See, when we serve to large hospitals, you don't get paid by government or insurance company, you don't pay to your suppliers. No matter what price you get or what price you charge, you know, a supplier knows upfront that I'm not going to pay it in six months time. Somewhere I'll price that capital investment at working capital cost. So you do an efficiency improvement in the operation in the hospital where your sourcing cost will somewhere be higher. And even if you get 30% more increase in your price from Ayushman Bhar, that will all eat away with the way one manage the cash to cash cycle. We have seen from, you know, dealing with so many hospitals. So unless you look into uh, not only, you know, the price cap or pricing model, but also how, you know, the whole cash to cash cycle run, and how we really look into that entire process, it won't work. Uh, we need a national grid around, you know, when you're serving Ayushman Bharat or when you're serving any of those patients, I think the payment commitment has to come. Like GST grid, you know, today GST is successful is because of the GST grid. Like Rana, I was there in PWC that time. You know, the whole sustainability came because of there was a government infrastructure which is facilitating transactions. We need a similar kind of a payment gateway from government to take care of that. So only that fix, that problem is fixed. I don't think the price alone can solve the problem. Important. Shashi, uh, you run a different model. So what's your take on this? I think uh, 
it is not all gloom and doom. I mean, and I, I mean, partially agree with Sunil that, uh, and we operate primarily in tier two and tier three uh, cities. Although sometimes, I mean, our case is slightly different because case mix is always very very important, and we primarily being an oncology service provider, so more than eighty percent of the revenue comes from oncology services. So, so that makes it, and thankfully, the uh, the. The tariffs in uh, Ayushman Bharat for oncology services, I would say they're not bad. And in fact, in some of them, you'd be surprised we were already charging less. I've never told these things uh, yeah. than than what what it was. You know, I mean, what Ayushman Bharat has, has actually, uh, I, mean, I mean, put it into the list. So uh, our experience has been in few of the hospitals where we got uh, enlisted with Ayushman Bharat. We have been able to increase our patient base and our revenue by 15 to 20 percent so <clears throat> those patients who are not able to afford uh, cancer anyway being uh, i keep on saying it that it is not just the the deaths of the patient but it is the death of the, death of the family as well because of the financial uh, issues what the family uh, faces but uh, my in fact my worry is that if that is something which keeps on happening and they see it that the uh, they want to bring down the, the tariffs even for oncology in in future. I mean, I won't be surprised because uh, somebody would give them. Because I was in one of the meetings with Ayushman Bharat, and then uh, this was one of the points in which was which was there that the amount of radiation has increased. But they haven't understood the amount of radiation has increased not because the, that the doctors are I mean, writing more, it is because the patients who are not able to afford are actually, I mean, coming and, and getting it done. In one of our facilities in Nanded, before the scheme, I mean, we were doing hardly 30, 40 patients and we have suddenly increased it by you know, 70, 80 patients. So, because, I mean, the cash paying patients were, were, were not there and now when they don't have to pay from their own pocket, suddenly, I mean, it, it increases. But uh, for efficiencies have to be created and the scale what we have to achieve has to be done we operate for example in radiation and 18 linear accelerators i mean across the amount of uh, services i mean overall what we pay i expect i mean you never know i mean with, with the suppliers i mean there's a lot of suppliers in this room that what is the final price you know i mean what what you actually pay but we st still think that because of the scale at what we have bought that we will be able to um, get a better deal and then pass it on you know to the patients as compared to i mean what the other uh, players are uh, able to do it so you have to look into the complete you know supply chain and and see uh, how to reduce and bring you know better efficiency uh, overall into the system till now it hasn't affected us and but going back to uh, what uh, <coughs> namneet was saying that all the payments are coming but when the bill increases whether, I mean, they will still keep on coming. I have a huge outstanding from CGHS and ECHS uh, right now. If it goes the same trajectory, then again, it becomes totally unaffordable uh, for a player like us. See, I, excuse me. I have three points which I'd like to make. One is that while we are talking about the government, that this is what the <laughs> government is doing, this is how, there's very little we can do to change it immediately. If it happens, it goes in the long run. Yeah. So what do we need to fo focus on is that how do we make this viable for us? So one is what uh, Babi, we were talking about 40 people you've met startups in a niche. Why not? Let the specialists take over. This happened in the telecom industry. Everything else got outsourced to the specialist. Let there be a menu card that this is what this product, this doctor, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how you uh, uh, how you make it. But let there be that Ayushman, we, we talk about this elephant in the room. Let's put it in a pen. Let's say this is what it is. We are willing to support it with this product, with this doctor, with blah, 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 whatever. If somebody wants something better, then there's a different menu available, which is what happened for your CGHS. You, the patient, you tell the patient, no, this trend is better. Drug eluting, yes, it's more expensive, but put it, a lot of people will go in for it. Maybe this happens in Ishman Bharat also. So let's look at, put that elephant in a pen. The third thing is when you talk about, you talked about the Amazons and the uh, Microsoft. I think the Uber is what we've got to worry about. Because the Uber model is going to come in healthcare and that is what's going to change healthcare. And we need to start thinking of it right now. We need to let the specialist take over, like you talk about supply chain. Let there be a supply chain person who looks after your entire supply chain of the hospital. Let there be a housekeeping who looks outsource that. 
let the doctor be special. So you maybe make a menu and this is the package available in so and so hospital with so and so doctor and this is the cost. So maybe we need to start looking at these things. How do we change it? The Uber model is going to come in one way or the other where you can choose what you want, where you want to go and you know people will come to you, you can actually so that is what we need to work for. That is what we need to take healthcare to the next level. So just to add, the problem to is sorry to interrupt it over here. Uber has said they are never going to make money. <laughs> no. Maybe so. So, so we maybe need to so. be I mean, prepared for that, especially for investors. Maybe so. so that if yeah. you are never but going they, to make money, are I mean, so are they ready to put in money? There I mean, are so many verticals in that. Maybe one or two work <laughs> verticals do bleed. No, I, actually, Sadi, uh, most of the things you are saying are already happening for yeah. many years now. Like how housekeeping is outsourced, your supply chain and a lot of hospitals is outsourced, the pharmacy is outsourced. So all those things are already there. I think uh, what we are looking at, if you are talking about tech coming into the uh, healthcare space, I think uh, most of all it will be in improving access to care, uh, which could take any form of telemedicine, uh, improving delivery of certain things like drones, etc. being used. And of course, uh, what we are nobody is talking about is there is a dire need for healthcare data analysis. We are the only, I think, so the, one of the biggest industries which generates big data. Big da our big data is big. And uh, there is a lot of work going on onto the data analytics which will further help us in how do we optimize our services, how do we create efficiencies in our delivery of services, and what do we need to get the overall cost of healthcare down in the community as such. I think this will require a very concerted effort on the part of all the healthcare providers to come together. And there's already a document in place called the National Health Digital Blueprint, uh, which is looking at this. It's going to be uh, looking at how to create uh, personal health <coughs> identifiers, how to anonymize, how to uh, get basic data out, and how to create uh, interoperability, which will be the biggest challenge because most of the hospitals run different versions of uh, health information systems, which do not talk to each other. So the uh, challenge would be to force uh, people to have a unified API from those vendors and which can be plugged into a national debt network. And of course, I think the biggest thrust should be from the government to provide a basic EMR which can be given to in the rural areas, to the smaller nursing homes, etc. And I think we should be looking at that also as a way and means of reducing and of being sustainable in the long run. No, and bring yes. Vidor in because I think from a technology point, I think obviously I think we need a technological access. So we're not going to have geographical access, you know, still the rural areas would strain. Uh, we have a financial access to Aishman Bharat, maybe suboptimal, but there is a financial access. Those people, you clearly said a lot of people couldn't afford. So the question is today you have some treatment even if it's suboptimal. But I think going ahead, the technological access will become important. I think uh, one thing that we are working on is actually building a parallel uh, platform for data sharing between hospitals where your data doesn't even leave your hospitals, right? So distributed storage systems and all of that. And in fact, I think that should be on everyone's clear agenda is to at least store everything and then build capability to mine that data, right? Because Otherwise, it's like your, uh, you know, data is the new oil. No, data is not the new oil. Data is just a piece of land, and you don't know whether there's oil there or not, right? So, so one, we all, I feel, uh, need to get together. We built all the platforms. We built all the de-identification systems. Any HIS can theoretically talk to any other HIS. It's just the HIS companies don't talk to each other, right? There are ego hassles, and it's more of. A, uh, change management kind of thing. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, help anyone in this room, outside of this room, uh, use our uh, you know technology stack to to mine their data. And then to Shashi's point, you know the the biggest fear is in my mind is actually that when you have healthcare players coming in that don't care about profitability, right? That don't care about margins. Uh, uh, essentially, you know if you have a uh, a soft bank funded uh, healthcare company out there, right? Like why why are the Tajes and the Obroyas of the world scared of Oyo Rooms? Because Oyo Rooms doesn't care about profit. Right? They're, they're just about, about literally about bets. So uh, so I, I feel that uh, the, the uh, our biggest threat that we haven't heard about is some uh, startup founded by a 25 year old kid uh, with uh, five billion dollars uh, to just spend and not recover, 
<laughs> That's an interesting thought. Good. We must uh, talk off, <laughs> offline on this. Uh, Samir, one of the things I think is your investments and you've looked at and you're especially a healthcare focused fund. So what are some of the learnings and how do you see the next three years planning out? So we have looked at capital light models. So if you look at the investments that we have done, they are either in the specialty clinic space, which are capital light, more scalable. Because for a private equity fund, the challenge is that you have limited timeline to make an investment and exit. So scalability becomes very important. And second areas that we have looked at is medical devices, which are more attuned to the Indian environment. So I, I think with something like Aishwaman Bharat, both these areas will see a lot more uh, interest. Uh, and I agree with Shashi that the situation is not all doom and gloom. Uh, I think the good news is that India is targeting to becoming a five trillion economy sooner than later, right? And healthcare is now on the agenda of the government, right? So whether it's a double-edged sword, it works both ways. But from a situation where five, ten years back, healthcare was not really a political issue, today it has become a political issue. So there will be opportunities when there is disruption, which Aishman Bharat is causing. There is also disruption because of technology. I think opportunities will come. And for uh, you know, people like us, like Sunil, uh, private equity fund, venture capital funds, these are the opportunities which will, which will be interesting. So I'm not saying that Aishwan Bharat is good, right? I mean, there are challenges and certainly as a industry, we need to push back and try to uh, get the government to see light. But I think what I'm saying is that with disruption also comes opportunity. Yeah, well, I think uh, a lot has been said, maybe instead of sounding repetitive, one big piece, uh, uh, we all are uh, people who have quarterly targets, monthly targets to achieve. One big piece which if you as this team can influence and uh, make whether whichever bureaucracy is there to be owning up their timelines and targets, you know, if you could have a quarterly review with them that have you been able to, whether it's Ashman Bharat or whether NPPA and all that. And I think that is one piece which is important to be standing right in their faces because they also need to look in the mirror that all these policies, all these perspectives are great to have. But if they're not making a difference, make a quick change because you can't just keep hopping on it, you know, after five years, you know, maybe look at India healthcare again going down in the next few years. <clears throat> the big piece is that we let's not have an ostrich uh, syndrome, you know, in terms of that everything around us, we have done our best, uh, it's it's going to make a difference, you know, and I think each one of us, Dr. Maj and Bhavdeep uh, said, there are stakeholders, every, what's in it for every stakeholder, if that is not happening with whatever it's being done, maybe we as, you know, intelligentsia of this country in the healthcare space, plus with the bureaucracy, I think we all have failed. And uh, with due respect, there is a lot, lot of things to be learned from mature markets or certain economies. We have, you know, private equity folks like maybe Samir, uh -huh. <coughs> Sunil, uh, you know, other folks, etc., who can get in the best of what's available, Dr. Rana, yourself, in terms of which is there. Are we willing to learn from them? Because, you see, I was very provocative with the previous NPPA chairman. I said, look, sir, you are fantastic. You've brought this out. And uh, with due respect to this pricing structure, what you've created for the cardiac space. But if you were to go for your own, you know, stent, you were to go for your own kith and kin, which is one you go for? You go for a cheap Chinese import, you know, nothing against Chinese companies, but would you go for a cheap Chinese import? You know, he says, no way, I'll go for, you know, your Boston Scientific's the top end. I said, why? Because if you are, you're saying that all race horses, donkeys are all in the same band, everybody is in the same band, why would you go for? You know, it's good to have a pricing and to, you know, Narayan Didale's example, you know, it's we, the industry has been cross subsidizing. We have to make every place viable. It cannot be that one shoe size fit all. And I think every piece is, every industry, every place has to have a differentiation. You know, if you were to ask Dr. Margin to do something, you know, in, in a certain price band, it has to be viable for a particular place and a market where he set us up. You know, you can't have, obviously, if he goes to a Timbuktu town versus you know having an establishment here the entire structure is going to be different and one shoe size fit all does not work for this country this country can buy from a pin to an elephant so we have to have that differentiation there are business models which are going to be changed there are there has been gap and no doubt about it the trust factor has been missing across the entire industry that has to be revived back but there has to be a structured mechanism to review and maybe with your big four among you guys can give the government to look at your own self in the mirror every at the end of quarter if you are trying 
get all the stakeholders together if things are not working make a quick change and i think that is going to make this country's healthcare viable otherwise we're going to talk about this next year two years later and nothing's going to work i think the fair market value is something so even a doctor in india doesn't take consultation fees and he makes up money elsewhere which creates a lack of transparency so you know that's something which plagues the industry in the primary secondary tertiary if you bring that transparency you can also say what's the fair market value of everything like just like you know in in other industries and we don't need to take example abhi you wanted to say? yes uh, as navneet said that we have to look at healthcare as a business if we are our margins are getting compromised in one particular vertical which is through ayushman bharat ec ecgs or cgss there are other verticals where we can make money we can do that business a little more for example artemis does a lot of international business so did fortus we have to look at those particular verticals with a little more focus international business and that brings to us the medical value travel as an industry where investors and hospitals likewise need to focus a little more invest a little more because that also is the distribution chain the value chain that brings in and the per bed per night cap uh, utilization is very very low this is one one particular thing and also this has been added into the 12 champion sectors which niti aayog has brought in and put a 5000 crores of investment into that so in next 2 to 3 months 2 uh, to 3 years government is also going to spend a lot of money into that and if investors and hospitals likewise can look into this as a major vertical then this cross subsidization that navneet spoke about can happen wonderfully well yeah but i think again we need to look at you know for the first time indian patients would not go for an angiography or angioplasty but it's beginning to happen they're going to dubai they're going to singapore i got a call from one of my colleagues in bowman grad he said i never seen a patient in 10 years i suddenly find that patient coming in here why because the stent he wants in india is not available the patient is going to nepal with the doctor yeah with the yeah, doctor yeah, with the doctor. <laughs> that is because of the lack of transport that that's yeah. called a package deal <laughs> that's the uber yeah. that's, that's the uber model so that's what we are doing also see ideally when a patient wants to travel to india he is comparing the cost from five different cities so he is uh, he is checking mumbai delhi bangalore chennai he is checking everyone it, it doesn't matter for them whether to travel to mumbai or delhi the what does it matter is there is a lack of serious transparency when we are looking at the cost perspective of it when we are looking at ayushman bharat i am saying we should also look at the sales side of it which is the major stakeholder which is known as the patient so if the patient is not happy there are severe cases whether you do it a cheap cost or you charge the five star if he is not happy he is going to uh, it, the, the the world is changing fast it is it is going to so it is going to be so open that if if some patient doesn't like a certain doctor they are going to tell that this is this is not the space we should be in so if someone says that oh, doctor doctor at atomis is wonderful they are going to go there so it is going to be in next three years i mean we are we looking at it where mm-hmm. what an, a sangli patient would love to hear from mumbai pune and nashik he would not love to hear from delhi probably but he should know the cost in real time where i should consult where i should go No, I think you brought in. See, the incumbents never disrupt an industry. It's the outsider, and in this case, it's likely that the patient will disrupt this industry. Uh, Roni, would like to say something? So, uh, interestingly, I come from the. Uh, I mean, practically speaking, the other side of the table. So, we are a part of uh, you know a top five uh, diagnostics. Uh, I would say manufacturer and supplier in the in the industry. So, uh, when when we actually see the the title of the of the topic three thing interesting word which i picked up was uh, the visibility the sorry the viability the investment and the reforms so i'll just give a very straight practical example you know so we are a company which uh, practically has 80 odd percent in the a1c market so which is your diabetic uh, testing <clears throat> so when we did the the viability Five years back, the per test cost was at one twenty one thirty. Today, the per test cost has come down to sixty. So that <clears throat> brings in the other topic, which is investment. So when we are talking about investment, I mean, <clears throat> ideally speaking, we sit in the same room, uh, competing with China, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, where from a multinational perspective. the attractiveness of the market in these geographies are far better as compared to india and just to give you an example i mean if you do a cross integration and if you do a backward integration and try to do a manufacturing in india 
to be very surprised is that when we did the entire cycle, the cost of the product, unfortunately, is not coming down to the extent that we actually went into while doing the project. Now, the final thing which comes up in the in the picture is the reforms. And I think most of you have already spoken about that what exactly are the things that are expected from the government. But to somebody's point, uh, you know, we can only discuss. But my expectations, you know, we have had a couple of meetings with the government, including the health secretary and so on and so forth. But uh, I've seen that, you know, the, the kind of, uh, I would say, uh, affinity to change is is a lot less in this country as compared to the uh, I would say countries like China. So you know that brings on to the topic that if there is a multinational who wants to put in money vis-a-vis uh, -vis a lot of other markets, uh, being a part of the board members, I always seen that you know we lose on to China where the ROI is way better, way attractive for two reasons. One is of course the size of the market, and the second thing is that the ease of doing business. So I think uh, we have in bits and pieces we have touched upon uh, in 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 uh, the various uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, guys that have spoken on this forum uh, but that's that's I would say the interesting part that we have from a supplier standpoint right I think that sounds good uh, so I think we can go on and on this sounds more interesting I think a lot of practical issues and I think rather than you know stating the problem we are saying what could be the solution and if the solution doesn't come uh, what's the gloom and doom and how do you prevent it Obviously, I don't think there's going to be gloom and doom, but uh, it will be a painful process before, you know, we, we get this whole viability. But I think we've got a lot of areas riding. One of it to look positively is these 500 million people did not have because accessibility and affordability are linked. So it has come in, you know, at whatever price. Uh, and I think we also have this chance to put in the building blocks. And that is from the technology point of view. There were no imperatives and that's why IT was a cottage industry. But today there is an imperative to use technology to go ahead. Uh, I'll ask Pavan to sort of, you know, sum this up and then we can conclude. Thank you very much, Rana. And thank you very much. Eclectic audience, very sharp insights. Uh, let me try to sum this up as well as add my comments. So when we began, Dr. Harsh Mahajan said, that there has been a, an electoral re leverage which schemes like Ayushman Bharat or price control have given. Yes. In fact, this is a time immemorial thing. When Bismarck brought first time national health cover for the German populace, he brought it because he was being attacked by the opposition 1800s, 1890s, I think. Very strongly, <coughs> his throne was shaking. And he brought this and after that there was no looking back. He continued as premier term after term, though the scheme went down. Similarly, Atli, when he brought this NHS, it, he was against the most popular prime minister of UK. After having won the war, he defeated Churchill through NHS. So, I feel there is no going back on this. So one part of the perimeter which was said by uh, uh, Navneet that it will continue. Can, it, can we modify it as it goes, goes forward? This was one point. Second point was the legal option. When things, uh, when push comes to shove, we should be ready with a legal option. And let me tell you, from Medical Technology Association of India, we were ready with a legal option when the, uh, when the, uh, steno, when, when the implant, uh, knee implant uh, uh, price control came and we were ready to go. And let me tell you, we were told very clearly by a bureaucrat who was behind this, that if you go all four CEOs of ortho companies and me, if you go, you must see who has made the announcement. The announcement has been made by made from the red fort so there will be consequences and he was not talking about legal consequences and after which individually all those five people including me who were quite strong and vocal in the press and otherwise kind of uh, retreated so when we have not been able to speak up frankly <clears throat> how will we be able to counter them in the court is another point However, I appreciate the passion which Dr. Harsh brought that let us, let us 
look at it seriously maybe earlier you were just five of you now when there will be 50 that number will give you confidence to forge ahead or counter <clears throat> the next point was whether it was a it's a tsunami or a massive opportunity so i think rana summed it very well that let us not lose this crisis waste this crisis because i think chaos is also a ladder in in business chaos is also a ladder some other people will emerge as leaders the ladders may not emerge from the same points earlier maybe providers climb the ladder Maybe this time the medical technologists or nursing staff, I do not know who will be the new entrepreneurs, but they are coming. Then another point which came was uh, from Bhavdeep, new money. He says new money is coming in. Why new money is coming in? Because old one money wants exit. Why old money wants existing investor wants exit? Because he was used to 25% EBITDA. Now 12% EBITDA or 10 or 8 seems very less for him. But the guy who's coming from outside might look at the status which it brings, this sector brings, as well as the 8 to 10% margin which it brings and he might be happy with it. So it might be a case of chronological dissatisfaction when the your profit margins have fallen. So I feel a lot of new money will come in. Then the next point which came in was cough and cold is also going to multi-speciality. And here, without taking too much of your time, I would like you to look at Clayton Christensen's research in this area from Harvard Business School. And he is saying very clearly through his research, he has found out first, home care cost is one tenth of hospital cost. Second, end stage renal failure is what they have studied. And they have studied that from hospital it came to private clinics and from private clinics it went home. And why it went home is because now the dialyzing machine is only as <coughs> big as a bread maker. And it can be plugged in the night, your blood is scrubbed clean. And here I would also like to bring in the point which Navneet said, we need new models. So we need to have models where uh, maybe we are talking about uh, micro hospitals. Uh, the next point which came up was price, uh, which I would like to say is price control in inflationary econ economies only leads to less health care. So when we are building the counter narrative as we should build, we should keep that point in mind and push it. So far a counter narrative has not emerged very unequivocally from the provider sector. Um, focusing of investments. Where should investments focus? I think fo the investment should focus first on diagnosis because diagnosis is the main gateway through, the, uh, through which the healthcare moves. Second on disruptive technologies as Vidur also spoke of and maybe new models of hospitals. Why new models of hospitals? Because in the five star or let me say very well provided hospitals the costs are all already sunk and why new models because why nhs in the beginning was successful or but at least acceptable to the rich as well as the poor because before nhs came there was world war there was a lot of bombings and the shelters which were used by the rich and the poor were the same so the sociological differences or behavioral differences got uh, acceptable to each other and the poor learned the, the sociological behavior of the rich and there was uh, you know, greater uh, miscibility. In our case, if you will bring in, many uh, hospital owners have told me that if we will bring in the, uh, the Ayushman Bharat patient, my rich patient will run away because there is a civic divide. There is a huge civic divide and what will happen to the uh, to the international patient? He has not heard, seen this kind of civic behavior. So these are also points we need to look at. Cross subsidization. Um, yes. And lastly, what I'd like to say is the gloom and doom can also be boom provided we look at uh, the the uh, look at it from a lens of possibility. 
try to change whatever is the narrative which has already been set by the government, it will take time. Meanwhile, uh, employ uh, the, these points which have been made by uh, several of uh, you to make this business viable through these moves. And lastly, I would like to say, uh, Blue Circle has discrete and deep access to think tanks as well as to the policy maker. I will request Siddharth to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, that the words here, the ideas here reach in the right format and encapsulate it to those who matter. Siddharth. Sure, sure. So, uh, so thank you so much for this thought provoking session and uh, rest assured the other uh, discussion will travel to those who matter and those who are thirsty to learn through our uh, digital channels, our video, our media publication to a base of 10,000 leaders across the country. And for those of you who are new with us today, the Blue Circle is an exclusive ecosystem and community to make leaders future ready through interactions with subject matter experts and with each other. And in fact, uh, we're doing on, on, on digital dis uh, uh, disruptions, we're doing a, a tech conference soon on blockchain and healthcare will play a large role of it. So I'll surely send the details to you at the earliest. So now I would, I would request you all to please join us for a session and thank you all for being here today. Thank mm -hmm. you.